Welcome back into the Wolves Den. I'm your host, Jay Burr. Make sure you follow me. We'll throw it up there eventually. Uh, welcome in here to the bowl edition. There it is. The bowl edition of the Wolves Den. Arkansas State taking on Nevada. It's a short A. Call them Nevada here. Uh, there you go. Tucson, Arizona, the Arizona Bowl. That is coming up here December 29th. That's a big day of football uh, in college football. But the whole day will get started off right there. You see the telecast if for whatever reason you can't make it out to that game. I advise you try to go. But if you can't, there you go. CBS SN. Let's get right into the matchup here offensively. How these two teams stack up. And you're going to notice they're very similar across the board in terms of the statistics. Uh, there you see the points per game. Very similar. And then uh, that's their rank in terms of the country uh, in the parentheses there. Uh, your rushing yards per game, 181 and a half there for the Red Wolves, 157 for the Wolf Pack. Passing yards, 282. That puts them in the top 25, uh, at least for the Red Wolves. But the Wolf Pack also right there in the top 25 as well at 285 and a third. And then the third down conversions, big difference there. 42.6% uh, for the Red Wolves. Really got that number up as the season went along. And Nevada, uh, they're at 33 a uh, little under 34% there. Puts them at 117th in the country. Um, also looking here, um, statistically, there we go. Got the red zone conversion rates, both fairly similar above uh, 84%. Uh, your explosive plays in terms of the raw numbers, these are plays of 10 yards or more about dead identical. 192 on the season for the Red Wolves. Wolfpack at 191. Uh, and then the sacks allowed. Arkansas State really shored that up again as the season went along. There only 21 allowed on the year. Nevada, they have not allowed anything. Ganji has been clean most of the year. Only 13 sacks on the year. And then you see the penalty yards there. 70 a game in terms of the yardage there for Arkansas State. 57.3. So both these teams a little susceptible to the penalty, but I would imagine that's because of the nature of their offense. Let's take a look at some of the defensive numbers. You see in points allowed per game. Fairly similar there. 26 and 28 respectively rushing yards allowed over 200 for the Red Wolves. So that could be something that Nevada can try to capitalize on because they do not allow a lot of uh, rushing yards per game. I'll see there 135 passing wise. Arkansas State, it's a no fly zone for those guys. Nevada having to deal with a lot of those passing offenses. So that number could be a little skewed. Same way there for Arkansas State dealing with a lot more running offenses. So uh, you kind of see some of the, the patterns developing there in terms of the conferences. Uh, or some of the differences there in the conferences. And then your third down conversions allowed. Uh, both of these teams pretty solid when it comes to that. 37% allowed there on the year for Arkansas State. Nevada only at 32%. Puts them 19th in the country in this thing. Uh, red zone conversions allowed on the air. There you see the numbers. Both are fairly solid there in the red zone, uh, at least defensively. Explosive plays allowed. Both these teams have shored things up as the season has gone along. Uh, both these teams can get after the quarterback. There you see, dead, even heat, uh, both with 32 sacks on the year. That puts them tied for 32nd, ironically, in the country. And then passes defended, pretty even there as well. 47 for the Red Wolves and 42 for the Wolf Pack. So, with that being said, let's bring in somebody who knows a little bit about these guys, Chris Murray. Uh, he writes and uh, produces for, uh, I believe it's Nevada Sports Net. Did I say that right? Yeah, Nevada Sports Net. Nevada. See, I got to get used to that. We say Nevada around here. Nevada. <laughs> it takes Sports, a while. Nevada Sports Net. Um, and, and I guess just talk to us a little bit about, about this team in general. Uh, what kind of season they had. You look at the record, 7-5. and five, uh, Obviously, a very similar path to things here that Arkansas State had. A little rough in the beginning, or, or at least in the middle of the season there. Put together a nice little string of wins. But for these guys, a little questionable head scratcher there at the end against UNLV. Yeah, I mean, I think overall it was a good season. They were three and nine last year in Jay Norville's first season as the Wolfpack's head coach. So getting up to seven wins, uh, definitely a step in the right direction. They beat two teams that, that did get to bowls uh, in San Diego State and in Hawaii. Uh, the Hawaii game was on the road, which is a tough place to play. So they're really happy with that win. It really came down to that last game, like you mentioned. UNLV is the big rivalry game. They play for a 545 pound uh, physical cannon, uh, and they painted whatever the color of their school is. So losing that game, uh, you know, really stung. Uh, it would have put Nevada on a five-game winning streak. Uh, they would have hit eight wins for the first time since moving into the Mountain West in 2012. So, uh, you know, they, they were playing really good ball at the end of the season. 
They were up 23 to zero against UNLV basically at the end of the first quarter. And then everything falls apart and they lose to their rival. And this will be the first time they hit the field since then. So, uh, you know, had they won that game, I think they'd be feeling great about themselves. They'd, you know, have a have a ton of momentum. And if they came and, you know, played really well in this bowl, they may have gotten some AP top 25 votes. But uh, given how that UNLV game went, uh, this is kind of, you know, the the opportunity to erase that. I mean, you can't get that cannon back, which means so much to this program. Um, but they can, you know, end the season, uh, you know, on a positive note if they go out and win this game. And the players have said, you know, how this game goes will kind of shape how they look at their season because up until the start of the second quarter against UNLV, everything, uh, you know, had gone pretty well. And uh, what kind of team are we looking at here offensively? Obviously, you know, the Mountain West known to kind of fling things around. We see uh, Boise State throw it around quite a bit. You've seen Fresno flinging the ball. In fact, those two teams have already played in their bowl games as we're doing this and have looked very well, or at least Fresno did. Excuse me, Utah State, the other one. But, I mean, just dismantles North Texas. Uh, and then obviously, too, for, for this team, what, what are they, what's their identity on, on the offensive side of the ball and even on the defensive side? Well, they hired Matt Mummy, so he's the, the son of, of Hal Mummy, who invented uh, the air raid along with Mike Leach uh, about 20 years ago. And the thought was they were just going to throw the ball all over the field. You know, they throw it 75% of the time, and, and they, they do a good job of throwing the ball, but it's more or less a 50-50 split. I mean, this is a team uh, that wants to run the ball as well. They had the Mount West Freshman of the Year in Toa Tawa. He is the younger brother of Vi Tawa, who played with Colin Kaepernick in Nevada and is second in program history in rushing. Uh, Toa could hit a thousand yards uh, in his true freshman season if he has a big game this week. Um, the, the the thing to me that kind of differentiates this offense and either makes it really good or really bad uh, are the big plays down the field passing the ball. Ty Ganji uh, will make some mistakes. He'll have some some interceptions through three of them against UNLV that really cost the Wolfpack. But he also makes a ton of really big plays down the field. I mean, uh, this is a team that's used to having a couple of 40, 50 yard passes every game out. Um, so that, that's the big key is, is can they have those explosive plays in the passing game and then the turnovers. They turned the ball over 26 times this year. That's twice as many as Arkansas State. Uh, if they're going to turn the ball over that much, uh, they're going to be in trouble in this game. That's kind of been uh, the second big key is uh, this is a team that didn't turn the ball over a ton last year, but it has this year. Uh, they've done a, a good job of taking the ball away on defense, but, but way too many turnovers. Uh, but, but a good balance. I mean, they can damage you both ways. They can damage you with the run. Uh, they can damage you with the pass. And given where Arkansas State's run defense was this year, I imagine they're going to try and lean on Toa Tawa and try and get that run game uh, going early on uh, to get uh, Ty Ganji some easier throws in the passing game if, if Arkansas State has to you know, stack the box a little bit more to slow the Wolfpack run game down. Absolutely. here And defensively, what's this team like? I mean, again, it's, it, we saw, sort of saw it in some of the stats and the matchups there. Uh, they tend to allow a lot of passing yards, but I think some of that is just a product of the Mountain West, and they tend to fling it around kind of the other way around with Arkansas State. A lot of these teams tend to run the ball. You kind of don't see a lot of passing. Uh, what, what's sort of the identity for uh, the Wolfpack there on defense? Yeah, I mean, it's a senior-laden group. These are guys that have been starters for four years, and, uh, you know, three of them are all conference players this year. Uh, when Jay Norvell took over, Nevada was dead last in the nation in run defense, gave up the most rushing yards per game and the most rushing yards per carry. So it's not like they were just, you know, uh, you know, getting run on a lot, and that was why the number was high. Uh, this is his second year. They ended up in the top 30 in the nation in run defense. They were in the top 20 for most of the season. So they've made massive improvements in being able to stop the run and that has allowed them to give up a few more yards in the passing game because teams know that they can't really run the ball against Nevada. Uh, San Diego State is a run first team and they came out throwing the entire game against the Wolfpack because they just figured they couldn't run the ball. So they made a lot of gains as far as that's concerned. They have two really good pass rushers. Uh, Malik Reed is a three time all conference player. He actually made the move from defensive end to outside linebacker this year because uh, he's a smaller body trying to get ready to potentially have an NFL career. Um, but he comes in there and he'll rush on a lot of downs as well. And then Corey Rush, a defensive end who was first team all conference this year, despite breaking his foot in that San Diego State game in late October, he is expected to be back for this game. So he hasn't played since that late October game. Um, but with the later bowl date, uh, Nevada was thinking they might have to play on December 15th. He wouldn't have been able to play in that game. He'll probably get a chance to play in this game, probably, you know, maybe only 20, 25 snaps. But they can really heat up a quarterback. Uh, they're really good uh, in run defense. And like you said, yeah, I mean, they're vulnerable in pass defense. Their safeties are pretty good. Their cornerbacks are a little bit weaker. Um, so there's some opportunity. Uh, obviously, Arkansas State has an excellent quarterback. Uh, there's some opportunity to throw the ball against Nevada. 
Um, and the, you know, the key again for the Wolfpack is those red zone stops and the turnovers because they will give up some yards. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a, a bend but don't break kind of thing. They do run a 3-3-5 stack with uh, Jeff Castile's their defensive coordinator. He was the D.C. at West Virginia when they were really good under Rich Rod and then at Arizona as well. So a really veteran group, uh, very experienced. You're looking at seven, eight seniors on the defense. Um, and, and they played really well up until, again, that last couple of quarters against UNLV. They hadn't given up, uh, you know, about 20 points per game in Mountain West play until uh, that UNLV game debacle. And obviously, too, a couple of key guys. You mentioned Corey Rush there. Maybe uh, could see some run in this one. And he, he's a beast. I mean, six sacks, only nine games. Had 11 and a half tackles for loss, again, in only those nine games. Uh, but a couple of major guys, and especially on the offensive side of the ball, that have decided to transfer for this bowl game. Uh, kind of what's the deal with that, and what kind of impact did those guys have? Yeah, I mean, McLean Mannix is the first one who made the decision. He's a kid from West Texas. He was a freshman All-American last year. The team's leading receiver as far as yards and touchdowns go. Uh, not a tall guy. He's like five foot nine, but runs a four four forty. Uh, potentially an NFL player. Um, he said he had to go back home for personal reasons. His mom actually uh, was burned. Her body was pretty badly burned in a car accident. Mm. And uh, coming out to the games uh, this year, there was a lot of fires in the area, um, in California and in Nevada. And, and she said. Uh, that she had PTSD symptoms um, coming back into the area. So he said he had to transfer because she couldn't come to the games anymore. Um, so, yeah, he made that decision right after the season ended. So he will not be playing in this game. Uh, really big impact. I mean, that's a guy who every team basically double teamed, and he was the guy you had to stop on offense. Then you look at defense, Nephi Sewell, a uh, two-year starter at safety, uh, played as a true freshman. His brother, Gabe Sewell, is the Wolfpack's middle linebacker. Nephi decided to transfer as well. He had closer to home. He's from uh, Utah. Uh, his younger brother plays at Oregon. He was a five-star offensive lineman. Uh, his younger brother, uh, more than that, is a 2020 uh, uh, recruit who's a five-star kid as well. So a very talented family. He decided to transfer to BYU, actually made that announcement yesterday. Um, so that, that's a big loss as well. That's a guy who, uh, you know, is one of Nevada's better defensive players. So they're going to be down two standouts from what they've usually been playing throughout the season. And, and that's going to make an impact, obviously, in the future. But I think it's going to make an impact in this game. Nevada doesn't really have any true game breakers uh, from the wide receiver position other than McLean Mannix. There's a young freshman, true freshman named Romeo Dubs who's come on strong, but isn't quite as experienced. And then Nephi Sewell, uh, Nevada typically all season started three safeties at, at uh, or three seniors at safety and, you know, was really able to rely on their experience. So not having those two guys, a big deal. And, and Jay Norvell was pretty, um, you know, open with what he thinks is going on. He, he believes you know, power five schools are, are basically coming into group of five schools and trying to poach their players and use them as a minor league system. And, you know, very much went on the record and talking about how this is a major problem, the new transfer portal where you just put your name in there and you're on the transfer market. You don't even really have to consult with the coaches. You just go tell the compliance office, put me in the portal. Um, he was not very happy about uh, that at all. He said he has a very good relationship with these two kids who are leaving. Uh, there's really four kids leaving in total. Two, two of them didn't really play that big of a role this year. Um, so, yeah, I mean, he's been he's been vocal about how he's not happy about this. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if, if more are to come, uh, you know, across the nation and, and, and whatnot. But, uh, yeah, two, two big losses for Nevada for sure. Yeah, definitely a, a topic. And we'll, we'll have to touch on this another day. But uh, it will be interesting to see how offensively, especially knowing that he was sort of the lead dog, uh, what 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 they'll end up uh, doing now. In fact, let's get right into this. Uh, let's go to the matchups here or the kind of the keys for this Arizona Bowl. We'll kind of go tit for tat. We'll give an Arkansas State one and then we'll kind of go to uh, Nevada. Um, I think too for Arkansas State, I think the O-line play is really going to be a key. Uh, like I said earlier, Nevada has a, ch has a pretty good ability to get after the quarterback. Uh, defensively, they, they, they don't allow runs and that's something that I think Arkansas State really needs to do in order to set up that pass. And uh, you mentioned that 3-3-5, and that was something that uh, UNLV gave them fits with and also Tulsa earlier in the year. Now, granted, they didn't quite find their stride by then, but uh, that concept there kind of gave that passing game fits. And if they're not able to run the ball, and then you're obviously not going to be able to pass the ball as successfully with all the, uh, the secondary out there. Uh, I, I guess, uh, how do you think that, that matches up uh, against Nevada, that the uh, Arkansas State offensive line, from what you know? Yeah, I mean, it's an area Nevada has been very good at. Uh, I think Malik Reed is the guy to watch. This is a guy who, you know, top 10 in the nation in sacks and forced fumbles. This is a guy who makes big plays every single game. So uh, if they can slow down Malik Reed, I think they have a good job, uh, have a good chance of slowing down the rest of Nevada's defense. Uh, Nevada basically 
under the previous coach, Coach Brian Pullian, who's now with Notre Dame, uh, they just recruited a bunch of guys who were 235, 240, and tried to tell them to run around uh, the offensive line and just try and get to the backfield. Uh, Jane O'Reilly's taking a different approach. He's trying to get guys who are 300 plus pounds, uh, and maybe they're not as good of a pass rusher, but they do a much better job against the rush. And uh, that's the big key is that Malik Reed is one of those holdover guys who has an ability to get to the backfield. Uh, I think Nevada will do fine against the run. It's will they get enough pressure on the quarterback in this game? I think getting uh, Corey Rush back is a big, big help. But this thing starts with Malik Reed. If, if Arkansas State can slow down Malik Reed and make sure he doesn't make any big plays, uh, they're going to be well ahead, uh, you know, in, in, in getting a good offensive performance out there. Absolutely here. And I guess uh, in return here for Nevada, got to establish the run is one of your big time keys here. Uh, obviously, they're they're a pretty balanced team both ways. Arkansas State, uh, as you saw, statistically struggles against that run. Uh, what do you think? Uh, how, do, how do they use that run and how do they use that uh, sort of in the overall scope of their offense? Yeah, I mean, they've been running the ball a lot more over the last month. Uh, I mean, it was fairly pass oriented up until the last month and they've you know they've really put a focus on running the ball uh, i mentioned toa tower earlier he's dealing with an ankle sprain so i think it'll be important to see if he's 100 percent and if, if he's ready to go uh you know physically maybe not the most gifted back but just has great instincts like i said his brother is a future wolfpack hall of famer and uh you know he just has a, does a great job of not getting uh tackled by the first guy and always falling forward so you have him and then you have kelton moore who's a five foot ten to 240 pound Running back uh, ran for about 125 yards against UNLV on like 13 carries, so very capable as well. Uh, and then they have a kid named Devontae Lee, who was uh, Oklahoma Player of the Year uh, last year, playing as a true freshman this year. Another, uh, you know, guy was 235, 240. So they, they want to be as physical as possible. The offensive line uh, doesn't have a, a bunch of big names, but they were pretty effective. I mean, you mentioned only giving up 13 sacks, also averaged uh, about four and a half, four, four point six yards per carry. So. Uh, you know, I, I think they're going to come out trying to run the ball. Uh, you know, they don't want to put too much pressure on Ganji coming off a game where he had a few too many mistakes and, and uh, interceptions. Uh, they might take some shots down the field, but I think in that first quarter, you're going to see Nevada run the ball about 60% of the time and see what, what it can get going there just because statistically that's the weaker part of Arkansas State's defense. Absolutely here. Uh, and also one thing, third downs. I think for Arkansas State on either side of the ball, and we've seen kind of the, the way that this third down tends to work for them. Is sort of how the results in this game tend to go. And this is on both sides of the ball. If they can convert third downs, chances are they're in it or it's a shootout type of thing. Uh, if they're giving up a lot of third downs, and this, is, I guess, is kind of football 101, if you will. Um, yeah, you got to stop guys on third downs. You got to shorten the drives, uh, get them behind the chains, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, what, what have you seen out of Nevada on both sides of the ball here in terms of their third downs? Because, uh, you know, again, it looked like, uh, Nevada tends to give up a lot of third down conversions. Yeah, I think I think the defense has actually been better on third down. I mean, compared to the last couple of years, for sure, they, they've done a better job of getting off the field mm -hmm. uh, and, and trying to get quick three and outs and things like that. It's been the offense to me where Nevada has had more struggles getting that third down. And I think that's why they've tried to run the ball a little bit more of late is to get into those, you know, shorter third down situations. Uh, like I said earlier, I mean, it's a very explosive offense. They have a lot of big plays. But I wouldn't say it's super consistent as far as being able to pick up those third downs. So for me, the key for Nevada is more third down on offense than third down on defense, where I think it's a little bit stronger. All right. And uh, I guess on the flip side here for Nevada, uh, you said uh, protect the ball, which, again, kind of goes back to that football 101 sort of thing. Uh, Arkansas State, a team that it doesn't generate a, a whole, whole lot of turnovers, but they're, they're advantageous in their turnover generation. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the interception's a little bit of a – an issue for uh, the Wolfpack this year. Yeah, and Ty actually, uh, if you look at his numbers from last year to this year, Ty Ganji is actually throwing fewer interceptions per attempt, but just that last game is pretty fresh in everybody's memory. Uh, he threw three interceptions in basically the last 20 minutes of the game. Two were right to a defender. Uh, not, not quite sure if he didn't see him or, or what happened on those plays. One of them came on a potential game-winning drive. They crossed midfield with about... 75 seconds to go and he you know throws an interception uh you know right to a guy who had had a pick against him the previous series in the red zone so uh, i just think you know if ty ganji does not turn the ball over nevada usually wins the game that that's the biggest key uh you know for nevada because he's going to make some big plays on offense it's just is he also going to throw in two or three big plays for the defense in the process uh so that 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 is a big key they didn't turn the ball over a ton last year the numbers have really ballooned this year in the bottom 10 in the nation in turnovers given up 
per game. The, the defense does a fine job of taking the ball away. It's neither really good at it or really poor at it. Yeah. Um, but just offensively, if Nevada's going to turn the ball over two times or more, it's putting itself in a hole. Uh, if it keeps it to one turnover or less, I think they probably end up winning the game. But, you know, that, that comes down to Ty Ganji being protective of the ball. Absolutely, and I guess are on the flip side, I'll kind of give you some of Justice Hansen's numbers. Uh, 27 and 6, the TD interception ratio. So another guy who just doesn't tend to turn the ball over. So I think uh, you mentioned we'll have a, another key for you here coming up uh, that would uh, really be key in some of that here. All right, uh, back on the Arkansas State side of things here. Secondary, I think, has got to be real sharp, uh, not only in terms of uh, the obvious passing game, but I think in terms of uh, stopping the run or helping stop the run if, if they can step up and help in, in those terms and then also uh, you can limit some of that damage uh, you mentioned the big play capability that these guys have about three or four per game of you know 40 or more uh, I, I think too Arkansas State could really uh, go a long way in, in terms of uh, success in this game if that secondary can really show up and show out and, and Jerry Jacobs one of those guys who's just been a phenomenal story in the Sun Belt as the year has gone on uh, really become one of the premier cornerbacks in this league uh, in terms of the stats here. Uh, only three interceptions, which in terms of a full season, not too shabby in, in a kind of a run heavy league, uh, but also 10 passes defended on the year, which puts him uh, top 10 in this conference here. So uh, I guess how do you how do you see Nevada trying to take advantage of that secondary, not only with that run, but with the pass? Yeah, I mean, we, we mentioned McLean Mannix not being on the team. Right. It's really Romeo Dubs who steps up and is kind of the focal point for me if I'm Arkansas State. They have a Washington State transfer, a guy named Caleb Fossum, who was a walk-on at Washington State. Came to Nevada, uh, injured his knee last year, missed the entire season, and has been very reliable in the slot. He has about 70 catches. But you're looking, he's, he's a possession receiver, a game-breaking receiver is Romeo Dubs. This is a guy who, as a true freshman, has gotten better and better as years gone on. He was actually a quarterback in high school. They ran a wing tee offense. He played in a Southern California school that nobody really ever recruited. It just wasn't a good program. Uh, but Jay Norvell, who literally wrote a book on wide receivers, uh, was a very good NFL wide receiver coach with Jerry Rice and Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison, saw something in this kid where he could be a wide receiver. And he's just been, he, he has NFL athleticism. He's a six foot three kid. The first time he touched the ball as a college player, he returned to punt 80 yards in the Nevada season opener. Um, he's the guy who uh, has really, uh, you know, been their best receiver over the last month. Arkansas State needs to slow him down. He, he is just a guy who can completely, you know, change a game when he's on and when he's consistent. He's going to be a very good player in the future. He's kind of already a really good player now. So uh, if I'm Arkansas State, I'm making sure that he doesn't beat me. He's the guy to double team now with McLean Mannix out. And you let Caleb Fossum and Elijah Cooks and guys like that get whatever they can get underneath. Just don't let Romeo Dubs beat you. And I think that has to be the key for Arkansas State secondary. Oh, yeah, it'll be interesting watching uh, what we believe will probably be Jerry Jacobs and that matchup as well. Uh, and then also, too, for Nevada, jumping back to that. Yeah, you mentioned motivation. Uh, obviously, the four transfers, uh, a little bit of a heartbreaker uh, for this team. Uh, two of those guys being key contributors uh, to the team here. Uh, I mean, is, is it one of those things where it's just – do, do people, do, are guys buying into the program or, or is this sort of, uh, you know, maybe one of those things where yeah, maybe not as big a deal? Yeah, I mean, I think the guys who are there are, uh, this is a pretty senior laden team. I mean, I would say at least half of Nevada starters are seniors. These are guys who have been through a lot of coaching fire. They uh, had a teammate drowned in Lake Tahoe a couple off seasons ago. Um, you know, they've been through just a ton together. Uh, you know, obviously a really bad season last year, a bad season the year before that. Um, so I think they want to end their careers on a high note. But to me, bowl games oftentimes just come down to how motivated are you? We saw, you know, the Colin Kaepernick-led Wolfpack teams, which had 8, 9, 10 NFL players on the team. Uh, in one bowl game, they were shut out. They didn't score a single point against New Mexico in 2007. Uh, that was the first time they had been shut out since 1980. It was an NCAA record for longest games without a shutout. Wow. And then they were favored by like 17 against SMU in the 2009 Hawaii Bowl. Ended up losing 45 to 10 against a quarterback who had never started the game before. So weird things can happen in bowl games. If you come in motivated uh, and fully into the game, I think you already have an advantage on the uh, opposition. I mean, obviously, Arkansas State has been to a ton of bowl games. Um, do they maybe get a little bit complacent because this isn't like special or new to them, whereas Nevada hasn't played in a long time and a lot of their seniors have never played in a bowl game and they seem to be genuinely excited about it. Um, just have they have they also emotionally got over the loss of that UNLV game, uh, given how important that yeah. is. Any Wolfpack fan will tell you 
beating UNLV is way more important than, than winning a bowl game. So uh, I think just whichever team comes in here, uh, more focused, more motivated, uh, I think has a leg up. And and there are question marks about whether Nevada will do that, given how the last month of the year has gone. Um, and that's really up to the coaching staff. That's up to the coaching staff to have this team fully engaged, uh, you know, in the final game of the careers of a lot of these players. Uh, you, you mentioned that that UNLV loss. In fact, Arkansas State kind of struggled with this last year uh, in that Camellia Bowl where they, they had a heartbreaker to Troy, uh, which would have given them a conference championship or at least a share of the said conference championship. And, you know, it just it, it was a carryover effect. Now, granted, that was a little quicker uh, in the process here. But, yeah, I think that's going to be uh, really interesting to see, you know, you losing a game like that to your rival, and especially kind of the way the season has gone for them and to be able to lose that game. Uh, I think it'll be real key, especially early on in this, and we'll see how that uh, that plays out here. Uh, I think for, also for Arkansas State, got to pressure Ganji. Uh, this is a guy who tends to get a little loose with the ball. Uh, you mentioned the interceptions. Uh, he tends to be a little interception prone. I think if, if he can get rattled early on in this one, early and often, I think it really shakes him up a little bit, maybe make him a little more one-dimensional uh, in terms of wanting to run the ball and maybe not put the game in his hands, which could – uh, in effect, shut down that entire offense here. Um, I guess from what you've seen throughout the season, how does he respond to pressure? How does his team uh, try to counteract uh, some of that, that defensive front for Arkansas State? Because those are some cats who can get after the, uh, the, the ball in the backfield. Uh, one of the leaders in terms of tackles for loss and also sacks. But this is a team that doesn't give up a lot of sacks. Yeah, I mean, uh, like most quarterbacks, if, if you get pressured uh, and if Ty Genji gets pressured, he's not as good. Uh, he's not a guy who's a scared to take a hit, but uh, I mean, he's clearly not as good of a quarterback when there is pressure on him. He's pretty mobile. I mean, this is a guy who was running read option under the previous regime. So, uh, you know, it's kind of been a pretty big change for him to go to read option pistol stuff into, you know, air raid. Um, so he, he can, you know, get some first downs with his legs for sure. Uh, he's a good athlete, but, uh, you know, he, he can get a little trigger shy, uh, you know, if he does get some pressure in that backfield. But uh, like you said, I mean, only 13 sacks. And I would guess four or five of those came against Fresno State when uh, Ganji was out with a leg injury and his backup uh, Christian Solano was making his first college start. So really, sure. if you're just looking at games Ganji has started, it's less than a sack a game. And uh, you have to give major kudos to that offensive line for doing that. The, the offensive line was pretty beat up to start the season. The team's starting center missed all on non-conference play with a uh, displaced elbow. Um, so they've gotten a lot better as the year has gone along. They only returned two starters from that group, and one of them was that center. So they were basically playing with four new guys at the beginning of the season. Um, so, yeah, that, that is a huge key. But I, I think Nevada has done a pretty good job of protecting Ganji. He hasn't been put in a position too often. Uh, you know, where where he's getting mauled on a, a regular basis. So, uh, obviously, yeah, that's a key to any game. Uh, I think it's a big key with Ty just because of how he tends to react to that kind of stuff. Um, but, yeah, usually if given time, uh, he's a guy who's going to, you know, pick you apart. He's going to make big plays. Um, he's going to get the job done. So, uh, you know, Arkansas State, obviously very good at rushing the quarterback, as is Nevada. Um, so that is a big one coming into this game. And uh, I think, to me, it's strength against strength. Obviously, Nevada right. good at not giving up sacks. Arkansas State good at getting sacks. I think if Nevada keeps them to, you know, maybe three sacks or less, they'll probably take it as a win. Uh, now, in terms of get, uh, offensively, uh, do, do they try to – are they real quick with the passes? Uh, uh, kind of how is that offense built, or, or is it one of these things where – I mean, you mentioned the, 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 big, the big play capabilities. Uh, do, does he have time to just sort of sit back there, pick a defense apart? I mean, what, what have they uh, shown throughout the season? Yeah, they try and get the ball out quickly. I mean, the air raid, that's kind of the principle is just get somebody into space and get them the ball. Right. Um, but they have, you know, obviously, if you're throwing the ball 40, 50 yards downfield, you need a couple of seconds for that play to develop. So there are some times where they need really good protection. And they, uh, you know, it's not like they play a ton with the tight end. They will bring a tight end in there. Uh, but it's usually up to the first five and the running back to, to take care of the, uh, the, the defensive line. So, uh, yeah, I would say probably 75, 80 percent of the plays, uh, you know, they're getting the ball out quick. They do do a lot of wide receiver screens. Um, but there is, you know, maybe once every 10 plays, they're, they're going to go deep on you and they're going to need some protection. So there will be opportunities for Arkansas State to try and get home, uh, get into that backfield because Nevada needs four or five seconds to get the play, um, you know, engineered. And what kind of uh, quarterback specific runs do they do? They do a lot of that. Uh, you mentioned some of the RPO capabilities from the, the, the previous regime. But but this year, I mean, you mentioned the air raid. It's kind of like throwing the ball over the field. Uh, how often does he does he take off? Yeah, not a ton. He's not running as much as he was when they did have that backup in against Fresno State. They did the read option quite a bit to try and play to his strengths. The one wrinkle they have thrown in this year is they're doing the Wildcat. That's not something they had done last year at all. 
uh, really. And, and they, they've done it quite a bit this season, one with Toatawa, one with Devontae Lee. So they have two different wildcat packages. Devontae Lee's more like a goal line kind of back where they'll throw that in uh, and they'll put the backup quarterback in at that point and line them up at wide receiver. So you're probably going to see uh, on a maybe one or two series, a pretty prolonged stretch of wildcat plays. Uh, when they beat Oregon State earlier this season, basically the entire first drive were Wildcat with Toatawa, and they went right up and down the field. So that, that's been a very good package for them. Uh, I wouldn't expect Gianchi to be running too much, but you are going to see a lot of quote-unquote quarterback runs out of that Wildcat with traditional running backs behind center. And you mentioned on the flip side here for Nevada, got to pressure Hanson. Uh, again, this is a guy who's usually pretty cool, calm, and collected, even under some pressure. And as you can see uh, with those interception numbers, he, he doesn't get rattled a whole lot. But we have seen some games, especially early in the season, middle part of the season, uh, App State was able to get after him. Uh, we saw the results of that game. Same thing uh, with Georgia Southern. We kind of saw the residual effect of that and then you know Bama well they get after everybody so we'll kind of put that one yeah. off to the side here but um, what is it they do defensively maybe with that that front seven uh, that that really tries to get after the quarterback because this is also a team that can get after the quarterback uh, with 32 sacks of their own yeah, and it's not a traditional way of doing it. Obviously, the odd man fronts, three, three, five stacks are a lot more common now than they were maybe 15 years ago. But a lot of it, you don't know where the pass rusher is coming from. Obviously, if Malik Reed is anywhere near the line, you're going to want to you know, put a couple guys on him. But, uh, you know, they brought Gabe Sewell a lot more from the middle linebacker spot. Uh, Lucas Weber, uh, who's another outside linebacker who starts, has a few sacks this, this season. So uh, they don't do a lot of cornerback or safety blitzes, but the linebackers, Usually one of them is coming, uh, you know, after the quarterbacks. So uh, that that will be a challenge for teams that haven't seen a defense like this a lot. I mentioned Jeff Castile with his time at West Virginia and Arizona. This guy was like one of the first guys to create the 3-3-5 sack. He's been running it for 25 years. So, uh, you know, he's an expert on it. He knows exactly how to pressure a quarterback while doing it out of, uh, you know, disguised uh, formations and things like that. So it's not a traditional, there are four guys on the front and they're gonna be running, uh, you know, and, and doing maybe a stunt or something like that. They're gonna be coming from areas that the offensive line probably doesn't know at snap. So uh, it'll be very important pre-snap that they figure out who's, you know, rushing and, and all of that kind of stuff. Just because, you know, when they first put this in last year, when Jeff Castile got here, they were basically getting a sack on every play because the Nevada wow. offense didn't know exactly where they were coming from. So. You know, it's a little bit more difficult scheme for offenses to pick up. Uh, I think fortunately for Arkansas State, they've obviously they're going to have a month to try and, you know, figure this out. Uh, I think that extra prep time really helps them because, they'll you know, they'll be able to watch every single game film 15, 20 times if they want to and get oh, right. a better feel for exactly what Nevada likes to do on defense. And again, we did uh, point out earlier that this team has gone against a couple teams who did deploy that 3-3-5. Uh, so it's going to UNLV uh, kind of sold out against the pass against them earlier in the season. Tulsa sort of running a little bit of a 3-3-5. I'm not sure how similar uh, schematically uh, they were with that. So they do have a little bit of experience. And I think, too, if, if they do deplore that, you'll see a little more Justice Hansen running the ball. Now, the past uh, probably latter half of the season, you didn't see a whole lot of design runs out of him. Now, he's a guy that can also run, and they will run him, too, uh, to kind of kickstart the offense. So it uh, should be an interesting uh, sort of matchup. Uh, to sort of watch and see how people sort of react uh, to sort of uh, you know the way the, the way things are rolling in, that, in those terms here. All right, uh, last key here for Arkansas State, I think the emotions. Obviously, got to control them. This is a team that likes to play a little bit on the edge in terms of uh, you know flying off the handle or not. Uh, this is sort of part of their defensive swagger, especially. Uh, we we've talked a lot about on this show how that uh, they, it tends to lead to a lot of 15 yarders. Uh, for this team, they've, they've really reeled it in as the season's gone along. Also, too, uh, with the uh, announcement uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, their head coach's wife, Wendy Anderson, her cancer has returned. Uh, seems it'll be a little worse than what it has been before. Uh, this is a very tight-knit group. Uh, and uh, in that Cure Bowl a couple of years ago, uh, when this sort of really came to light the first time here, uh, you saw this team really rally around head coach Blake Anderson, even pulled out the win, last team to beat UCF. Uh, in, in the country here. So I, I think that'll be a thing that you have to look out to look look for is how do they uh, come off emotionally in this game, especially with all these little X factors going on here. Um, so I, it should be interesting. Uh, again, Nevada also draws their fair share of penalties. Uh, what, what kind of penalties are we looking at with these guys? Because I know, you know, obviously with a lot of passing offenses out there in the Mountain West, you tend to see a little bit more of these types of things. And especially with offensively, you got sort of your holdings just because Things take a little longer to develop, and also on the defensive side, 
you're going to slip up and get a, a holding or a defensive pass interference from time to time as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say there were somewhat um, personal foul prone early on in January Rails mm -hmm. tenure last year, and then even like the first five, six games this year, but they've really done a good job of uh, avoiding those kinds of things. Uh, you know, I don't think Jay Norville gets too upset if if there's maybe a hold or a false start in there. It's just, you know, don't give up 15 yards on doing something stupid. Uh, right. And they've really avoided that of late. Uh, so I think, yeah, they're, they've made progress as far as that's concerned. Um, you know, I think for the most part, the secondary has been good in avoiding too many, you know, pass interferences and things like that. The offense might be a little bit more, you know, turnover prone. I haven't crunched every single number and, you know, gone over every offensive line and, and see where they rank. But it just feels like maybe they, they have a few more mistakes uh, than your average offensive line as far as penalties are concerned. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they've, they've avoided the, the big uh, penalty of late, uh, which I think is a, a plus thing. Yeah, like we spoke about earlier, you want to be motivated, but you don't want to be stupid with the emotion. You don't want right. to be giving away first downs and things like that uh, that can potentially swing series and, and swing games. So um, yeah, that, that, that will be key. And, uh, you know, obviously, uh, like you said, with, with the head coach's uh, wife situation, uh, yeah, I, w I would imagine Arkansas State will be pretty emotionally into this game to, you know, try and win one uh, for his wife. So uh, I, that that's also a, a minor factor in the game as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, turno our turnovers are big in every game and, and penalties are big in every game. And uh, Nevada, I think, has done a better job with the penalty aspect of that than, than with the turnover aspect of that. Absolutely. Here. And I guess last key here for you guys, uh, special teams you mentioned. Uh, this is going to be a fairly interesting matchup uh, if, if you want to really if people like to look at offenses defenses you get into the trenches and all that sort of thing but uh, Cody Grace probably this is probably the number two I well, know it is statistically the number two punting team in the country they don't allow a lot of returns uh, but uh, Nevada uh, number two in the Mountain West in terms of punt returns here so uh, and always with a team like with with a game like this even matchup on both sides of the ball kind of got their pros and cons it's always something on the special teams that tends to break things open. Yeah, and, and when you look at this game, it's a pick, basically. These teams are almost mirror images of each other, so uh, it, it reasons to make sense. If one team's special teams plays really well, uh, they're probably going to win the game because everything else feels pretty even. Nevada's uh, punter has been pretty solid. Their kicker, uh, a kid named Ramiz Ahmed, who made it through a student walk-on uh, tryout. It was you know, pretty interesting story. <laughs> wow. joined the team last year and is now the starting kicker. Um, he's been solid. He's missed a few extra points. Uh, he's got a big leg. I mean, he can kick it out to 55, 60. It's just wow. the accuracy. Uh, and then you mentioned the punt return. I mean, Nevada, like I said earlier, Romeo Dubs had a punt return for a touchdown. They, they've used three or four guys back there. McLean Mannix has been one of them. So uh, they might go a different route. They, they've also had some, some issues a couple of times. They gave up two special teams touchdowns and a loss to Toledo that basically cost them that game. Uh, they had two punt fumbles against Hawaii, which didn't cost them the game, but you typically don't have two punt fumbles in a game and yeah. still win. So, uh, I mean, they've made big plays. They've given up big plays. I would say on average, the special teams is probably a shade below average, um, but better than last year when they were pretty darn bad uh, at special teams. Um, so the, so it, it's, it's, it's a thing that, uh, you know, I think Nevada would probably take a push in the special teams game because of some of the issues they've had. Um, but they they also you can't you have to give them some credit. They've also made some really big plays in special teams, and uh, you know they they basically beat San Diego State because of special teams. Yeah. They pinned them back inside their five yard line like four or five times. Uh, they were outgained by almost 200 yards in that game. They were out first down by 10, uh, but they won it because of special teams. So uh, you know they, it's kind of heckling and jo uh, uh, whatever that saying is. Uh, um, uh, so so you've seen good, you've seen bad. Um, for the most part, uh, I, I trust the kicker. I trust the punter. Uh, it's been, you know, in the return game and the coverage game um, that's kind of been the issue. So, uh, you know, I, I, I would not be shocked if there was one big play in special teams that kind of won this game. And last time Nevada played in a bowl game, it was the Arizona Bowl 2015. Uh, they, again, were outgained by 200 yards by Colorado State. They were out first down by, I think, 14 first downs, but they ended up winning the game because they kicked a, uh, got a kickoff return for a touchdown by Elijah Mitchell. It was Nevada's first kickoff return for a touchdown since 1998. Oh, wow. So it had been uh, a darn near 20 years. And they won the game because of that play. They were pretty clearly outplayed, uh, you know, on uh, offense and defense, um, but they made the plays in special teams. So, um, you know, uh, in any game, it's a third of the game, as I'd like to say, but I think maybe even more important this one because of how evenly matched the other two facets appear to be. Absolutely. It'll be real interesting to watch uh, both of these special teams units at work. Uh, again, it's kind of a funny thing to sort of bring up uh, as, as a real big factor in a game, but I think 
the punting of Cody Grace, uh, I think he's averaging like a 4.4 .4 hang time. So uh, not going to likely generate a lot of punting, but I think the kickoff uh, teams will definitely be a big factor in this one. And I guess overall here, how do, you, how do you really see this one going? I mean, obviously both these teams have about a month to prepare for each other. Uh, a very similar teams. Do you see this kind of being a high scoring affair, maybe a low scoring affair? Uh, it might take a half to really get things going. H how do you really see this one breaking down? Yeah, I mean, uh, usually the longer the layout um, layoff between the end of the regular season and the bowl game, I feel like the defenses have a little bit of an advantage because mm -hmm. the offenses are a little bit out of rhythm. So I, I'm thinking high 20s, low 30s in this one. I think if a team does get the 30 points, they win the game. Uh, like I said, Nevada's defense had been really good up until basically the last you know 40 minutes of the UNLV game uh, they were stringing together a lot of games holding teams right at that 20 point per game mark so um, very capable both teams on offense uh, you know very capable both teams on defense so I think uh, you know it's going to be close I think it's going to be within a field goal or two I think it's going to be you know like I said high 20s low 30s um, I haven't like broken everything down to make my prediction which I do on on game day every sure. every, every game um, I do like Nevada's you know they've beaten two bowl, bowl teams uh, obviously Arkansas State has not beaten a bowl team uh, so far this year I know right. they beat a team that would was bowl eligible but didn't make it so that probably makes me lean a little bit more toward Nevada's side just because I've seen them go out and beat you know pretty good teams so far this season um, but yeah it's going to come down to the things that games usually come down to turnovers uh, maybe it's a big play in special teams uh, you know, third down conversions for sure. And who can, who can, you know, go out there and, uh, you know, really engineer plays when the game's on the line, because it's going to be on the line in the fourth quarter. And Nevada has not been a good fourth quarter team. That's one thing uh, that they've made a lot of progress under Jay Norvell, but in the fourth quarter, they have not been great uh, e either last year or this year. I mean, they almost gave up uh, a 20 plus point lead to Air Force. They almost gave up a 20 plus point lead to Oregon State. They did give up a, a 20 plus point lead to UNLV. So fourth quarters has not been Nevada's forte. Uh, and obviously they're going to have to win this one in the fourth quarter because it should be close, you know, going into the final couple of, of drives. Interesting that you say that because uh, Arkansas State's kind of been a second half team uh, as the year's gone on here. Uh, they, they tend to be just sort of feeling things out a lot of times early on in this one, second half. Uh, they seem to really start to hit their stride, at least here in the latter half of the season. We saw against Texas State, uh, it was a 7 0 uh, lead for them in that one. And then all of a sudden, boom, it was 33 to 7 for you. Even blinked an eye. Uh, so this one's going to be fun. I'm with you. I think it's a very even matchup. And I, man, I honestly don't know what to think about this one just because uh, both these teams are very mirror image. Uh, they do a lot of similar things. It's going to be fun in this one. In fact, I think uh, I've seen some articles where this is probably the most similar game out of all of the bowls here. And there's a reason that uh, initially this was a pick em. It's kind of gone back and forth. If uh, you guys are into those entertainment type things, I know you guys are big into that out there in Reno. So uh, it'll be interesting to watch this one. Uh, are you going to be out there that one? Uh, actually, we're sending two other people from the station. So okay. um, we'll, we'll have two people out there. Uh, Nevada basketball, which is undefeated and ranked in the yeah, top 10 in the great. country, is also playing the same time at Utah. So uh, at, literally at the exact same time, they're going to be playing the game. Um, so we kind of had to split our forces and send some people to one and send some people to the other. So uh, big day for Wolfpack fans, obviously, um, yeah, to, to watch a bowl game and a top 10 team uh, in the nation in basketball at the same time is uh, not something that happens a ton for, you know, mid-major kind of schools. Absolutely. G5 rise up here. Uh, well, brother, we appreciate you coming on here, uh, talking with us. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to return the favor for you guys here. But uh, just for our people here uh, who want to maybe keep up with uh, Nevada, Nevada, uh, where can they find you and, uh, and all, your, all your stuff? Yeah, so all our coverage will be on NevadaSportsNet.com. And then my uh, Twitter handle is at MurrayNSN. So uh, either way there, uh, we should have a ton of good stuff uh, leading into the game. Fantastic. So there you guys go. Uh, if you want to get uh, knowledge on all things Wolfpack, mm -hmm. there you go here. Uh, again, brother, we appreciate you coming on here, and uh, hopefully we'll see some of your people out there. Sounds good. All right, brother. All right, so there you have it here. We've got the matchup set. It's the Dances with Wolves Bowl, as the Arizona Bowl has dubbed it. Wolfpack v. Red Wolves going to be a fun one. And again, it be a very interesting game as, as both these teams very evenly matched in terms of the offense, the way they like to do things defensively. They, they're a little different, but both tend to create a lot of chaos. So uh, it's going to be a chaotic game. It's going to be a fun game. I am going to be out there. Eight straight bowl games now for Jay. So uh, make sure you tune in right here. Fox 16, fox16.com. Follow me on the Twitter at DJ Burr. 
all those good things here. Fox 16 on the Twitter as well, all of our social medias, all of that stuff. So make sure you tune in, get in, and we will see you guys out there December 29th, 2018, Arizona Bowl. We'll see you then.